This has been the special coverage of the World Economic Forum deliberations taking place right here in Kigali, Rwanda. We have been speaking to delegates who have attended this function, of course, just trying to get a bit from them on the outcome of WEF 2016, and more from that, also interviewing them on their various jurisdictions. Today, speaking of delegates, I'm joined by none other than Dr. Patin Joroge, who's the Central Bank of Kenya Governor, to just talk to us about WEF 2016, and also more than that, also look at the macroeconomic status of a country. Thank you for speaking with us, Dr. Njoroge. Thank you for inviting me and um, I'm really glad to be here. What's standing out for you in this World Economic Forum deliberations? It's good to mention that uh, this sort of international event, uh, World Economic Forum, it's really a unique occasion for all of us, leaders, um, business community, uh, people at all levels, uh, let's say, people who are push things forward um, to come and uh, sort of uh, discuss what works, what doesn't work, their own experiences, share experiences. It's very good from that perspective. Let's look at the financial health of Kenya. And here I'm looking at, at a diversified um, industry. We're looking at the industry, its exchange rates, looking at the inflation numbers. From where you sit, how are we faring? We have stabilized the economy and 2015 was a stabilization year. And uh, I know at the, your, your, your viewers know that there were, there were, I mean, towards the middle of the year, the inflation was running high. And inflation expectations were also quite unhinged. And uh, also the other concerns, um, the exchange rate was uh, dropping like a storm. Uh, meaning it was depreciating quickly and so forth. Uh, so I think what we did in 2015 is to stabilize the economy. And I think all understand now, for instance, that uh, inflation has come down. Last month it was 5.3. And uh, in, terms of the, in terms of expectations, that has come down quite a bit. The foreign exchange market is also very stable, uh, meaning the... They're, it's quite balanced and uh, this is something that is obviously uh, been noted by various uh, uh, some of our peers and uh, surprised positively that we were able to engineer this sort of outcome in such a short period of time. Secondly, uh, there is the whole business of the, uh, it's true, we haven't reduced interest rates on commercial lending rates, but remember those are those are things that uh, the commercial banks need to reduce and we've been pushing them in that direction. So on the whole, growth also was very good last year, 5.6 relatively. Um, so on the whole, last year was a stabilization year. Let's look at a sector that has been in the news of late and uh, this is the financial sector and particularly the banking sector. As a regulator, you've introduced different initiatives to really look at uh, regulating the banking sector as a whole. Um, if you could kindly touch on them and also what is ailing the banking sector? I think there's nothing ailing the banking sector, nothing. What happened is there were specific institutions, three in particular, that hit uh, some, uh, I mean, that, that were in trouble. That is, that, uh, that is not a reflection of the, banking se the rest of the banking sector. And I want to be absolutely clear about that because we've said that uh, the banking sector is stable and resilient. What happened is the, the first one, as we know, Dubai Bank, back in uh, August, this we put in receivership for reasons that are clear. There was a lot of fraud um, and other issues, um, so that led to the closure, and that wasn't a surprise to most of your viewers. Um, then we had uh, the second institution, Imperial Bank, an Imperial Bank was a surprise to many people because it appeared to be a stable, strong bank. But I think the point here is you had that overlaid with a lot of uh, dubious uh, operations. We talked about fraud, we, don't, we talked about uh, uh, financial, uh, the financial reports were being uh, uh, falsified in all sorts of ways. These are all things that speak to very bad banking practices. I have said before that banks are not, uh, you know, they are not sort of your, your corner store. 
or you buy vegetables or whatever else it is. I mean, banks, you are, have funds provided, given to them by depositors on trust. So there's that sort of very strong uh, responsibility that comes with that. And so you, can, you need to run banks correctly according to the law um, that will protect depositors and so forth. There was a third institution, uh, third institution was Chase. And uh, again, it, was, uh, it, it has a very interesting DNA, as I have said. Very strong on SMEs, uh, SACOs, um, NGOs, charmers. So it's very extended, very strong also on IT. Uh, so the various Mufukoni, I think that's what it's called, their apps and things like that. It, it's actually very avant-garde sort of institution. What brought it to receivership was, as I said, the miss, um, the performance, the bad performance by the managers, in the, in, sorry, the directors in various ways. Th that we resolved. Uh, we resolved that issue, as you know, um, and we managed to reopen the bank uh, within three weeks. And that is something, as we have said before, is a, that's a fast for our jurisdiction, um, meaning shutting down the bank and then opening, reopening it um, in, such, in such quick order. Um, so these are, all, this is, these are the facts. The point is that we say that each one of the issues that are ailed each one of these banks are unique to them. So there's nothing systemic. So that brings me to your question of uh, how do I really see the banking sector? We've taken this these sort of events as opportunities to deal with the banking sector, to put it on a firm foundation. That's really the correct way of saying it. So you could say we tipped into what I am calling the new normal. And the new normal is a situation where we, that is founded on three, three pillars. The first one, the first pillar, is very um, it is uh, an issue of transparency, transparent operations of the banks. So this means, for instance, that there will be, you know, the accounts mean something. The accounts are actually done correctly. Um, that actually there's also transparency in terms of communication of their plans and so forth. For instance, when they lend to, to uh, their uh, board members and all that, it's, it's actually reported as such and so forth. So these are all things that are positive. The other one, of course, is uh, the other pillar is uh, stronger governance so that, uh, for instance, the shareholders hold accountable the board and also hold that and the board holds accountable the management. The second one was, uh, was governance. Governance meaning stronger governance and stronger governance in terms of uh, the management holding, uh, well, holding staff accountable, uh, the board holding management accountable, uh, shareholders holding the board accountable in that way. So everybody up and down the chain. Of course it means uh, also that uh, they, if you make mistakes, you will be uh, held accountable. So all the people that have been um, involved in this misbehavior will be held accountable in various ways. There is a section, there's also another element which is the central bank will have stronger supervision or better supervision. That's all part of the enhanced governance. Thirdly, the third pillar is the pillar of stronger, more effective business models. And uh, it means that banks need to wake up and uh, look at, the sh at, the, at what's happening around them and uh, see how to be more resilient. And that may involve or will involve some consolidation for some banks consolidating with institutions that are complementary, which is key. Um, so the stronger, they'll be stronger, more resilient, and indeed it will require them to be more innovative. So those are all elements that I think, those are the three elements of the new normal. We are already in the new normal, and that I think is what gives us comfort that we are much, in a much stronger position. Dr. Njoroge is still staying with the financial sector, and here I'd really borrow a lot from your past experience, especially at the International Monetary Fund. 
Is what is happening in Kenya perhaps a replica of other African nations? Um, after the glo global financial crisis, uh, there were the, the advanced economies, the, those jurisdictions, the United States, for instance, and indeed Europe as well. They, there was a switch and a strong emphasis on what we call ethical banking or you know the ethics of bankers this is a bit surprising to some meaning in the past you know nobody thought that uh, those two could be in the same sentence or the same noun uh, but uh, but in, indeed it became clear that this was extremely important so the point is there was a reset to proper banking in this way okay there this is what we are saying we are the first jurisdiction in africa that has actually reset in this way We've put these things front and center. All bankers will be held accountable in this way, and not just by ourselves, but also by the market. So in that sense, we are very happy that uh, we are where we are. We didn't choose this, we didn't choose the timing, but we saw it and, and went for it, meaning took the opportunity and drove for it. And we are sure that other jurisdictions will, will follow this because this is the sure path. The Treasury Cabinet Secretary has been recently quoted uh, saying that he will look towards a more sophisticated system audit, especially um, for the banking sector. How do you hope to roll this out? Uh, first and foremost, the responsibility of supervising institutions is the central banks. So let's begin there. But the, So I think the point here is how are we dealing, how are we supervising, how are we dealing with the banks? And the Cabinet Secretary, of course, understands uh, uh, how this is how we are doing it. This is why he was explaining it in this way. Um, but I think the point you'd want to, I would want to make uh, in answering your question is that the, uh, as I said, what we learned from the, uh, from the, from the experience with Imperial Bank, that is the, what was going on in there. The IT systems can be used to compromise uh, the entire operations of an institution. This is not a surprise. Uh, we know of institutions, for instance, that have been brought down by a single rogue trader. Single rogue trader. I'm talking of, you know, you could think of institutions out there, and I'm not going to name them, but you, you know the ones I'm thinking of. One single trader can actually bring an institution to its knees. So you need to have systems. You need to have ways of knowing what's going on. Uh, I'm talking of the managers and so forth. And conversely, you can say that the IT system could be compromised in ways to hide those sort of operations. Either deliberately, or because you have a rough trader that actually, or a rough um, employee who, who then uses this sort, of, this sort of weakness in this way. So it is important to audit the IT system. And uh, as you know, at the end of last year, we wrote to all auditors and told them that, reminded them of their responsibilities as auditors, meaning the statutory responsibility in their audits, and uh, that they needed to audit according to certain standards. You know, this, there's nothing new there. But at the same time, they, we told them that they, we requested that they actually do an audit or rather they give us a report on the status of the IT system. So this goes back to the point that I just now mentioned. So you have experts look at the IT system and give us their judgment as to you know, how stable, how strong, um, where the checks and things like that. And this they've done. But I'm not saying that this is the only time we're going to do it. This has to be something that is done in some sort of consistent way. Not just not every year, but you know, in a consistent way. That's one element of uh, IT. The other one, which I think is also useful to point out, is that we uh, need to strengthen the way we do uh, our bank supervision. And here is where IT can be useful. Um, and there's nothing, you know, there's nothing uh, magical about it. I mean, now you're using your laptop to type this, you're not using a pen and paper. I mean, you read newspaper on your, 
you call it a newspaper, but actually you are reading it on your on your screen. I mean, there is progress. There are things, if effective ways of doing things more efficiently, more effectively, and I think bank supervision is also one which needs to use the new tools. Um, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, let's say bringing in a way that you can get the information correlated in a way that you can see very quickly where the institution is. That those are the ways that we are strengthening. But I guess uh, it's something that is uh, that has started, uh, and uh, we we know where we are going. It will take some time. This is not a flip of a switch, and the place is in you know the thing is in place. So. Yeah, but uh, we know where we're going, so we just have to stay the course. Looking at, you know, um, other foreign investors and even local investors trying to look at investment opportunities, especially in the financial sector, you speaking with them, what are some of your key advice uh, key investors to them and even as you talk um, about Kenya? I think the first one is uh, bet long term on the economy. Don't do it short term. Uh, short termism is gone. Uh, we should be betting long term in the economy. And there is a lot there. So that means, for instance, when you invest, your returns will be coming through um, over you know, several years, not just over the next few months. That is essential. The other thing is look at our strengths. Look at the strengths of the economy. Uh, the economy is quite resilient. The economy has various factors. For instance, we are, we are very connected to the region. Uh, so, for instance, 40% of our exports go to the Comesa region. And uh, also, well, we are highly diversified in our exports. I mean, these are our sources of resilience. We actually, our macro framework, which is essential, our macro framework is quite strong. Um, so, I think the point here is let's look at our strengths and deal with those and lead with our strengths. Thirdly, innovate. Innovate, innovate, innovate. We need to innovate. Um, we cannot uh, remain where we are for the rest of our lives. Before I let you go, sir, um, I'm just looking at the East African community. Mm. There is a target towards launching um, a single, the, the monetary platform. Of course, we're looking towards having one currency for the region. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a platform that, of course, was budgeted for about 10 years, looking at it. What will it take for East Africa to have its own currency? There are many things that need to be done between now and then. Um, I think the, the uh, commitment is clear, uh, the protocols have been signed, as you know, that shows the commitments the, that uh, the various jurisdictions have. But as to where we will be and all that, I think those are, I mean, it depends on, on many other things. Nobody, for instance, uh, saw the global financial crisis coming and it hit us. Uh, and so we had to focus on it and not on other things. So I think the point here is, you know, we need to be, we need to understand where we are. And uh, even as we know where, what our aspiration is, um, and at times the, the direct route is not always the, the safest. So now we leave that, but uh, the, the commitment is clear. Last but not least, All right. what motivates you in your work? What motivates me in my work? I think the several things. Uh, first is I enjoy my work. I'm an economist. I spent all my life training for this. So I enjoy it. Now it may be boring to others, but that's not, I mean, that's not them. That's, I mean, that's them. That's not me. I enjoy what I do. Um, I enjoy occasionally the challenges that I have. I am not saying I enjoy all challenges. That would be very, uh, let's say, sick, sickening in a sense, but um, but I think the point is also, I mean, it's nice to have an opportunity to push things forward. Um, this is, this is, there's no dull moment. There are many things that we are doing and uh, you can see very clearly the impact it has on the economy, on the people. It's not just about the economy as such, it's the human beings, the 45 Kenyans that are there. And uh, you see the impact also on their livelihood you see that the opportunity is opening. You see that sort of aspirations that uh, they see and, uh, and reach out for. So I think those are the things that push us forward. Um, sure, it's tough. Uh, there are those moments when, uh, when yeah, you really feel the, 
the weight of what we are doing. But then you look again and you see other people who are excited about the outcomes of some of the results of various things and uh, the support of uh, everybody around you. I think that's, that's why we do what we do. Thank you very much, Dr. Sure. Patrick, for speaking with us on NTV. Thank you very much.